Today we're going to cover Hebrew words and how to pronounce them. It's called syllabification. So previously we learned the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Beit. We learned vowels. Now we're going to learn syllables. There are two basic rules. Every syllable must begin with one consonant and have a vowel. And two, there's only two types of syllables, open and closed. If a syllable ends in a vowel, it's open. But if it ends in a consonant, it's closed. Now, another thing you need to know when it comes to syllabification is that uh, Hebrew tends to accent at the end of a word, not at the beginning. So for English, it's a little different than we're used to. So force yourself to place the accent of the word at the end. When Hebrew accents somewhere else in the word, you'll see a, a little, I don't know the name of it, carrot or V that's sideways, something, something like that. It looks like the, the less than symbol in mathematics. You'll see it above the syllable that will have the accent. Now there's a couple of naming systems when it comes to accents. There's the, the uh, ultima, penultima, uh, anta penultima. There's the tonic, pretonic, and pro pretonic. It's helpful to know, but is it absolutely essential? Nah. So you can learn it if you want, but basically the final syllable, the last syllable is the tonic syllable or the, or, or the ultima. And that's the one that usually gets the accent. And then the syllable before that is the pre-tonic or the penultima. And then the one before that, the third before the end, is the uh, penultima or the pro pre -tonic. It's not absolutely critical. It, it can be helpful to know that information, but it's, it's really not essential. Now let's talk about the dagesh. Remember the little dot that can occur somewhere in a consonant, there's the dagesh lene, and that makes a bagad kafat more solid, right? Instead of it becomes t, for example. When it comes to syllabification, the dagesh lene doesn't really do anything. The dagesh forte doubles up on that consonant. So in terms of syllabification, it helps identify where to split up words. Look at ata, for example. Ata has a dagesh forte. It is doubling up the tav. So the first syllable is the aleph through to the tav. The second syllable is the second tav through to the he. When you have a dagesh forte, you double up the consonants. It splits up the sounds in terms of syllabification. At, ta, at, ta. But when you pronounce it, you simply combine it, ata. Now keep in mind a few rules when it comes to bagad kafats and uh, is it a dagesh lene or is it a dagesh forte? Rule number one, it is a dagesh forte if it is preceded by a vowel. So in ata, for example, before the tav with the dagesh, we have a patak underneath the Aleph. Therefore, the Tav and the Dagesh is preceded by a vowel. Therefore, it's a Dagesh Forte. Rule number two. It's a Dagesh Lene when it's preceded by a consonant. Look at Malcha, Malka, Queen. Before the Kaf and the Dagesh, we have Lamed. Now, the Lamed has a uh, silent Shava, okay? So the silent Shava does not act uh, as, a, as a vowel, okay? It's as though it's not even there. And because it's not there, the cough is preceded by a consonant. As a result, the cough has a dagesh lene. And that means it simply takes the sound and makes it more of a sound. In terms of syllabification, they're already separate because the silent Shava ends that syllable. We'll get into that later. And the third rule 
for Bagad Kafat is when it occurs at the beginning of a word, as long as the previous word doesn't end in a vowel, then the Bagad Kafat that starts that word is going to have a dogesh lene. Confused yet? Now keep in mind when it comes to gutturals, and that includes resh, they cannot take either dagesh lene or dagesh forte. Now let's talk about the shiva and how it works with syllabification. There's a simple rule that you can remember. Keep it simple, silly. The kiss method, okay? The vocal shiva, the one that you pronounce as though it's like a short I. The vocal shiva will always occur in an open syllable. A silent shava will always come at the end of a closed syllable. And what we mean by that is after a short vowel. So to put it another way, a shava is silent in terms of syllabification. If it is immediately preceded by a short vowel, otherwise it is vocal. If it is immediately preceded by a short vowel, it's silent. If it is preceded by anything else, it's vocal. So you have to remember what are your short vowels. Don't forget, it's pathak, segel, kirik, tomets, and kibbets. Now there are some nuances that the grammar goes into, so we can cover that here. So under our main rule that the shava is silent if it is preceded by a short vowel. Looking at malka, malka as an example, queen. It's Mame, Pathak, Lamed, Shava. Well, it's preceded by a Pathak, short vowel. So that Shava is going to be silent. Mal, not Male, Mal. If there are two Shavas side by side, or what we call contiguous, or what I like to say in a row, the first Shava will be silent. So look at Mishpate. The first Shava is silent, Mish closes it out. It's the te. If you find a shava at the end of a word, it is silent. And for syllabification purposes, it doesn't exist. Look at kathav. It's got two contiguous shavas, but one is at the end. So it's as though that one at the end doesn't even exist. And since the first one follows the rule of the silent shava, where there's two contiguous, the one is silent, that one's also silent. So they're both silent in this case. It's an exception that proves the rule. Now our second main rule for the Shava, the Shava is vocal if it's preceded by anything other than a short vowel. So for example, an initial Shava is always vocal. Look at Biraka, I mean blessing. That Shava that begins at, at that word, it's vocal. So it's got a real short I sound, bih, bih, bih. Going back to our previous rule that we saw under the silent shava, when you have two contiguous shavas side by side or two in a row, the second will be vocal. So if we look at our example again, mishpate, mishpate. The first one, mish, silent, not pronounced. The second one, huh, huh. So real short I sound, mishpate. Oh, that means judgment, by the way. Now, a shava under any consonant that has a doggish forte. So a consonant with a dogish forte. It's vocal. Hamilachim. Hamilachim. Even though the pathak is preceding, the consonant has a dogish forte. We have a dogish forte because, because the Bagad Kafat is preceded by a vowel. So we have a dogish forte. And when the consonant has a dogish forte and it has a shava, that shava will be vocal. So instead of Hamlachim, it's Hamlachim. And then a Shava after a long vowel is going to be vocal. Look at Kotavim, writing. The holum there is a long vowel. So the Shava that follows has to be vocal. Just keep in mind, guttural. Okay, we have Aleph, Ayin, He, Chet. They can only take a silent Shava. They can only take a silent Shava. But... Thresh can take a vocal shava. One quick note on the comets versus the comets hatuf. We've seen before that comets hatuf is the ah sound from an o, whereas comets is the ah sound from an a. They sound basically the same. 
it's good to know of. It's not critical. It's not absolutely essential. Just be aware of it. When you have a closed syllable that's unaccented and you see what looks like a comet, it's a comet's hatuf. The comet's hatuf can only be in a closed, unaccented syllable. Look at chachma. Chachma. The first syllable is closed. Chet the ka. It's unaccented. Ma is the accent. It's the ultima or tonic syllable. So that first comet is actually comet hatu. A regular old comet will happen in a open pretonic, meaning it's not the final syllable, or a closed accented syllable. So if it's a tonic and it's closed, which by definition it, it should be, uh, it's a comet. So when we look at Devar, Devar starts with Da, which is open pre-tonic comet. And then finishes with Var, which is closed tonic. So when that happens, it's comets. So in here, we see a double comet. Now sometimes, but not always, you'll have a methag. It's a little line to the left of the comets. And that signals that you're dealing with a comets and not comets hatuf. When you see the line, it's a comet. Why? Look at batim, houses. It's open pre-tonic. We have the added benefit in batim of seeing the methag to clarify it is a comet. However, if you remember the rules, comets prefers an open pre-tonic syllable, which is what we have here. So if you remember your rules, you know it's a comet. However, we have the added benefit in this particular instance of seeing the methag. We don't always see it, but when we have it, it's nice. Let's talk about the furtive pathak. Furtive pathak is simply when you have a pathak at the end of a word underneath either chet or ayin. And instead of pronouncing the chet first so that it sounds like cha, you invert it. Ach. Ach. Okay, we're not using ayin here because ayin has no pronunciation. So look at ruach. It's not ruha, it's ruach. And then we come to the quiescent aleph. Now aleph is a consonant, but it can function as though uh, it's a vowel. Normally it's not pronounced. And when there's no vowel underneath the aleph, it's basically functioning as a vowel in that scenario. So for the purposes of syllabification, even though it's not pronounced, you're going to attach it to whatever consonant comes next. Look at khatat. Khatat. This is the word for sin. So the aleph has no vowel underneath it, so it quiesces and attaches to the final uh, consonant. It's still not pronounced, but in terms of breaking up the word into its syllables, that's what happens. Lastly, we have the Hebrew diphthong. And in this case, it's a pathak combined with a yod and a hirik. And it, it makes the ayya, ayya sound. So look at the word shemayim, heavens, or bayit, house. When you see this diphthong, it's all one syllable. So you take whatever consonant is above the pathak all the way through to the final uh, syllable, uh, final consonant after the yod hirik, and that's one syllable. And syllables that have uh, this diphthong are closed. So now that you have learned how to figure out what the syllables are and begin to pronounce words, you should practice. One of the things that will help you do that is to learn your vocabulary. And now in the chapter, we've come to our first set of words. Now, the good thing is you don't have to learn a ton of words. Roughly 300 to 400 words is enough to help you read 
around two to uh, around two thirds to three fourths of the Hebrew Bible at any given point. That's up to 75% readability just by learning around three to 400 words. So these words are very useful to know. These are the basic meanings. When you look at a lexicon, a fancy word for dictionary, you'll get a lot more nuance and semantics, but these are the basic meanings of each word. Memorize them, do word association, whatever you have to do. For example, we, we saw the word buy it. When you come to a house, you buy it. So whatever tacky, funny, cheesy word associations you can do to help you remember what the word is, do it. Those mnemonics are going to help you immensely. Practice pronouncing them. Take your time. You're not going to be an expert and that's okay. We're looking to read. Pronouncing or pronouncing, pronunciation, syllabification. That's good to have, but it's not truly essential. When it comes time to discuss it with other people, it helps to be able to use similar pronunciation. And so if you're able to pronounce it to the best of your ability with some ease, it is helpful. But that's all I have to say about that. Next week, we are going to cover nouns. I look forward to introducing you to those uh, so that we can start getting into the uh, nuts and bolts of Hebrew. Hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, hit the like button. I'd appreciate it. Also, hit that follow button if you haven't already. And let me know in the comments below, what are the weirdest syllables that you've come across as you start to learn your vocabulary? And which syllables do you have questions on? Let me know in the comments below. With that, thank you very much. See you next week.